others to you know, make investments. We, um, you've joined us a little bit early, which is nice, but I don't want- That's fine, that's fine. Take your time, take your time, get ready. I've just come home from a very long day in parliament. What is it? I, I don't mind having a break. <laughs> what is it, like eight o'clock in the evening? Yep. Yeah. 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 So I don't want us to get going yet because- uh, Sure, sure, sure. There's no, there's, there's no hurry. Okay, I can, so the door will be open. I can take a break if you want. I can come back in five minutes if you want. Uh, uh, you can do that. You want to take a little? Sure. Yeah. I'll just switch off my camera and mic, and you know, I can hear you. So when you want me to start the class, just let me know. All right. Thank you very much. All right. center aisle so it, it will look like they're you're talking to very few people that is not in fact the case so i'm just gonna yep we'll give you a little ah, bit that's a bigger audience than yeah. i thought yes very that's good better. and then it goes it goes over to this hi side. everyone so so thank you so much for uh doing this i know it's evening time and it's a, after a long day of work for you uh, professor Varoufakis, in addition to being a professor, you're in the economics department. Are you? He's a professor of economics. He is a yes, a professor of economic theory, believe it or not. Economic theory, a member yeah. of the Greek Parliament, a former Greek finance minister, and the author of many books. And we've, I've introduced you before, so that's just a, a short introduction, by no means comprehensive. So. Let's uh, turn the floor over to Professor Vera Fox. I don't know how long you intend to talk, but uh, the floor is yours. You use as much of the hour and 25, 30 minutes that we have, and hopefully we have some time for engagement with you at the end. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank, Thank you for you inviting me. It's always to be back in, in a university setting. Uh, if it's... Uh, don't, in two dimensions as opposed to three dimensions. Uh, I believe that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this, this is supposed to be the last class of your semester. And you have uh, uh, been dealing with questions of, uh, you know, the possibility and practice of civilizing capitalism, of uh, reining in some of its excesses and um, uh, creating a better version of itself. And uh, at least this is what Stephanie said to me that you, you've been doing. And um, Stephanie, I think, invited me because she has this uh, strong suspicion that I am going to um, end your semester with uh, a radical um, take on things, um, a radical critique of the very idea of civilizing contemporary capitalism. And on this, Stephanie, you're probably right. This is what I'm going to be doing today. Uh, look, this project of civilizing capitalism did have legs and did succeed for a couple of decades between 1950 and let's say, say 1970, 1971, the post-war period. But before I explain why I think that the first couple of decades after the Second World War uh, are impossible to repeat uh, in our day and age or in the future. Let me um, begin with um, a brief summary of um, some very fundamental arguments that have been taken for granted by most liberal political economists and thinkers, liberal, small l liberal, in the way that you Americans refer to liberal. Um, in Europe, it would be social democratic, let's say, or center left. Um, the idea is that the marketplace, the institution of the market is an efficient machine for the purposes of maximizing the size of the pie. But the distribution of the pie if left to the devices of the market is unjust and um, can even be politically toxic. And that's why you need the state to step in, uh, take the pie that has been created by competitive markets 
and redistributed civilized capitalism through a redistribution of income, maybe a redistribution of wealth. Uh, in short, markets procure efficiency and politics, democratic politics, the state comes in in order to procure justice. That's more or less the argument in favor of a mixed economy, uh, a liberal economy, um, a combination of the merits that markets and state intervention bring to the proverbial table. Now, I come from a very different intellectual tradition. Uh, if you have studied economics at all, very few of you, I believe, have suffered this fate. Uh, thank goodness, my commiserations to the ones who have, I believe some of you have. Uh, any course in microeconomics will teach you, it begins with the assumption that uh, uh, markets are competitive, and uh, this is the norm. And what happens is once uh, you reach the end of the textbook of you know, micro 101, uh, then you start visiting market failures instances where markets fail. Well, the intellectual tradition from, from which I stem takes for granted that markets fail and only on occasion they succeed. So <laughs> um, this is a very different point of departure, but precise, to be more precise, there are two markets which um, from my perspective, from the tradition that I come, um, are guaranteed to fail. One is the labor market, and the other is the market for money. We can talk about this a bit um, uh, more in detail, if you wish, later on during the Q&A. Uh, but I just wanted to flag the quite different intellectual tradition I come from. For me, the usual assumption that markets produce efficiency um, is fundamentally profoundly wrong and contradicts historical evidence. The second point of departure is that I just don't believe that we, we have states that can do today what they could do in the 1950s and 1960s. In other words, intervene in a manner that procures justice. The very nature of the state after the end of the Bretton Woods system in 1971 has changed so profoundly that, uh, to put it a bit more schematically, if you think about it, when we shifted from feudalism to capitalism, what happened was a unitary sphere of power was divided into two spheres. Before capitalism, before the enclosures in Britain in the 18th century, let's say, um, if you were a lord, you were rich, and to be rich, you had to be a lord or a, or a baron. Political power and economic power were one. With capitalism, you have the schism of the sphere of power into two spheres, the political sphere and the economic sphere. Suddenly, you could be um, a, a deplorable, as Hillary Clinton might have said, <laughs> that is um, a dirty merchant without any of the um, aristocratic um, uh, paraphernalia that would allow you to visit the Queen in Windsor Castle and still be stinking rich. That happened only with capitalism. It was impossible before capitalism to be very rich, rich without having political aristocratic authority and power. So politics and economics, political and economic power used to be one. Capitalism split it into two spheres. Then after 1971, we have a further split. The economic sphere, the sphere of economic power splits into industrial power and financial power. The world of finance decoupled from really existing capitalism, from industrial capitalism. So you have this constant migration of serious power from the political sphere to the economic sphere, and then after 1971, the mid-1970s, from the economic sphere to the financial sphere. Uh, 
that was the end of the dream of social democracy. That was the end of the dream that capitalism could be civilized by means of uh, consistent government intervention that um, uh, supplemented efficiency with social justice. That would be my hypothesis. Now, let me be a bit more concrete in, uh, in articulating this, this position. In a sense, everything that we know in this world begins with 1929. 1929 was uh, a very significant point in time because it marked a turning point. We moved from the very early stages of uh, what I call monopoly or oligopoly capitalism to a period of crisis that spawned initially the New Deal, then the war economy, then the Bretton Woods system. And it was this, this transition, this turning point that yielded the golden age of capitalism, which was the time when people thought that, yes, we can civilize capitalism in the 1950s and 1960s. What happened with the New Deal, as you know, I'm sure your history majors <laughs> from what I have heard, uh, the New Deal effectively um, placed significant constraints upon financial capital. The bankers were, the, the, the genie was put into the bottle. Uh, FDR's famous antipathy towards the bankers translated into uh, turning the banking system into kind, a kind of utility system, a kind of boring credit providing mechanism, uh, which was neither sinking nor dancing. If you think about it, in the Bretton Woods Conference, which took the New Deal and, and, and expanded its limits, its um, um, realm to Western Europe and to Japan, that's what Bretton Woods did, uh, it, it, it's worth remembering that FDR um, prohibited one type of human being from entering the conference, bankers. <laughs> and the antipathy was mutual. Uh, life as a banker in the 1950s and 60s was exception, exceptionally boring. You couldn't uh, place bets with other people's money. You could not transfer money from one realm to another, from one country to another, uh, without the permission of the Fed or the IMF, for that matter. Uh, interest rates were more or less fixed, plus or minus, you may, something between 2.5% and 4%, 4.5%. Four Exchange rates were fixed for decades. Uh, even my little country, I remember I was growing up for years with 30 drachmas to one US dollar. So if you were a financier, it was a very, very boring life. And you really had to struggle very hard <laughs> to find ways of making money out of placing financial bets. That was a time when uh, the United States economy, having exited the war as the only credit nation, the only credit economy, the only one that was in a serious surplus, used its surplus in order to regulate the Bretton Woods system, that is Western Europe and Japan. Because the one thing that the New Dealers understood well, they learned that lesson the hard way, was that if you want to fix exchange rates internationally, then you have to manage those fixed exchange rates by redistributing or recycling the surpluses, the trade surpluses, wherever they are being produced, and they were being produced in the United States, because uh, let's face it, after the war, it was the American industry that was producing the surpluses of the world. The only way of maintaining fixed exchange rates and boring banks was by taking your surpluses and using them judiciously um, to very large extent recycling them into Europe, dollarizing Europe, or indeed Japan. Ask yourselves, why was it that the United States government, which has been traditionally a very protectionist government, if you look at the last 150 years, why did they let Toyota and Nissan enter the United States and destroy Detroit? The answer is because it was part of a global plan by which Japan was being integrated in the, in the dollar zone, under fixed exchange rates, Same, similarly with German industry, 
the two defeated nations of the Second World War were effectively subsidized by the United States to create two pillars, one in Asia and one in Europe, that supported the dollar system, which was the Bread and Wood system. It was under that system of managed capitalism, of a genuine mixed economy, with finance that was totally controlled by the state and constrained by the state, by investment, by capital flows that were heavily constrained by capital controls that were far harsher than anything the Chinese government is doing today. It was under those circumstances that you had that brief period, two decade long period during which capitalism um, was civilized. And what do I mean by civilized? You had the fastest reduction in inequality under capitalism with strong labor markets, very low unemployment and stable prices. That system was blown up by the United States. Why? Because it was, it was no longer possible to sustain it. And it was no longer possible to sustain it uh, because the surpluses of the United States of America, which were essential for managing that global system, disappeared. And by the late 1960s, the United States became a deficit country. Now, if that had happened to, let's say, Germany, or even France, or Japan, if they had slipped into a deficit, a trade deficit, a serious trade deficit and a budget deficit, uh, especially Germany, I happen, I happen to know that country quite well. Uh, I can tell you what they would do. They would um, panic and hit the austerity button in order to reduce the deficits, in, in, order, in order to go back into surplus. This is not the United States uh, <laughs> policy. It was not what the American government did. And this is not a Republican or Democratic thing. Um, either party would have done exactly the same thing. There is no deficit phobia in the United States, even by those who claim that the deficit is a great peril. Uh, what the, the American government did was it simply decided, OK, we will have a deficit. You know what we're going to do? We're going to increase it. We're going to, to, to floor the accelerator, <laughs> to hit the gas. Um, there was a very interesting conversation in 1970 either 70 or 70, I think it was 1970, uh, which involved a few people, smart people in the Nixon administration. One of them was Henry Kissinger, who back then was National, National Security Advisor. It was before he became um, uh, Secretary of State. Uh, another one was Paul Volcker, who later became the chairman of the Fed. Kissinger was not an economist. Volcker was actually a banker. Same thing, more or less, from his perspective. And uh, Kissinger asked Volcker the question, um, Paul, how can we remain hegemonic now that we're a deficit country? And Paul Volcker responded by saying, well, we have to make other people pay for our debts. Our deficits, not our debts, our deficits. We have to have the rest of the world paying for our deficits. And if you think about it, this is precisely what has happened after the Bretton Woods system was blown up. The dollar system, effectively you had what I call your exit. Um, Europe was thrown out of the dollar zone <laughs> in 1971. Uh, when the fixed exchange rates between the US dollar and the Deutsche Mark and the French franc and the British pound, the Greek drachma and so on, these were blown up. Essentially, uh, Europe was cast adrift from the dollar zone. And very, very soon after that, you had two things that were happening. One was that the United States increased its trade deficit vis-a-vis -vis the rest of, Western, of the Western world, of Europe and Japan. Uh, and the deficit of the United States started functioning like a gigantic vacuum cleaner that was sucking into the territory of the United States, the net exports of Germany, of Italy, uh, of Japan and later China. The deficit of the United States kept the German factories, the Japanese factories, and later the Chinese factories, you know, running, humming along nicely. 
producing all these net exports that, that the United well, why couldn't we here in Greece do this? <laughs> because we didn't have the exorbitant power of the dollar and we did not control the vacuum cleaner. The recycling that Paul Volcker was referring to when he answered Kissinger in that particular way uh, relied on the capacity of Wall Street to be able to magnetize around 70% of capitalist profits from Western Europe and Japan and then later China. So it's a kind of, it's a, it's a very special global vendor capitalism. So in a sense, you know, Mercedes-Benz was selling a car in New York, the profits of Mercedes were then sent back to Wall Street in order to be, to be placed as a wager in the financial market that the early stages of financialization by the merchant banks in Wall Street were making available to Mercedes-Benz. If you look at the period between the late 1970s and 2008, 2007, you'll see that this recycling sped up. There are ups and downs, of course, like in every economic and business cycle, but generally there is a steady increase in the extent to which the United States was sucking into its territory the net exports of the net exporting countries, while at the same time, capitalist profits from the rest of the world were flooding Wall Street Closing the loop. On the back of this tsunami of capital that was flooding Wall Street, Wall Street started building, especially after the late 1970s with the aid, the help of computers and computerization and algorithms, new forms of debt fueled bets, wagers, known as derivatives as well. And it was this combination of the recycling mechanism that I described and financialization under the ideological cloak of something that was neither new nor liberal called neoliberalism, which created the world that we live in and the world that crashed and burned in the fall of 2008. Uh, now, it is true that about a year, a year and a half after the crash of 2008, the American trade deficit, current account deficit, came back to where it was before 2007. However, it was no longer capable, it was no, no longer able to suck into Wall Street capital, which would then find itself into really existing capitalism, the real economy, in the form of investments. The way that capitalism survived it's the near-death experience of the fall of 2008, uh, how did it happen? What was the fundamental difference between 2008, which was my generations, our generations, Stephanie's and my generations, 1929 and 1929? The one fundamental difference was that in 1929, the Hoover administration, let the banks fail. In 2008, 2009, the G7 got together in April of 2009 in London under the, under, uh, under the aegis uh, of um, Gordon Brown, the prime minister of Britain at, the, at that time. And the G7 central banks coordinated their printing presses to print trillions of dollars and to refloat finance and not to allow the bankers to fail. That's the difference between 2008 broadly in 1929. Now, at the same time that the printing presses were going crazy in order to refloat finance after 2008, austerity was imposed in every Western region. Obama claimed to have tried to stimulate the economy, but if you look at both the federal governments 
and the state governments, and you add them together, the overall fiscal impact was negative. It was austerity. In Europe, you had the worst austerity in the history of the world, especially in the country where I'm speaking to you from. Um, we had um, uh, something like 15% of GDP taken out of the budget in one year. <laughs> that has never happened, even in, in wartime, anywhere. Not <laughs> actually, in wartime, usually what happens is the opposite. You have an increase in the deficit, not the reduction. Um, Britain had its own little austerity exercise under uh, Chancellor uh, Osborne. So you had essentially the central banks printing money as if there is no tomorrow to refloat finance. So you had socialism for the bankers and you had austerity for everybody else, which you know, is exactly the opposite of what you've been discussing in the course uh, so far about civilizing capitalism. This is um, turbocharging barbarism. Uh, socialism for the bankers and austerity for everybody else. But moving beyond any sense of rage that one may feel about the impact on people, a hard-nosed approach says something very simple. The moment you are creating or recreating all those bubbles in Wall Street, in the city of London, in Frankfurt, in Paris, in the Paris Stock Exchange and so on, through money printing, through QE, um, while at the same time, the vast majority out there are subjected to pension cuts, wage cuts, cuts in their services, cuts, 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 austerity. Uh, what happens is this. The central bank prints money. By law, it passes it on to commercial bankers. At 0% interest rate, sometimes negative. Right? Commercial bankers, the only way they can make money is to lend it on. They look at little people out there and say, uh -uh. <laughs> they're not going to be able to repay us. <laughs> they are subject to universal austerity. So what they do is they pick up the phone and they call a conglomerate, which like Apple, let's say, Google, Siemens, Volkswagen, right? Krupp, um, Alstom in Europe. Now, these conglomerates... <clears throat> In exactly the same way that the commercial banks would look at the little people out there and say, oh my God, you know, these people will not be able to afford anything. They did the same and they said, oh, we're not going to invest in new products, in new technologies, in uh, new product lines, because there won't be sufficient demand out there, quite rightly so, given the austerity. Aggregate demand or lack thereof in the world of real people out there. But they received this phone call from, you know, the Bank of America, from Societe Generale, from Deutsche Bank, saying, we've got all these, all these billions printed by the central bank. Do you want to, 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 to borrow them? So, you know, Siemens receives this phone call. Siemens is already sitting on quite a few billions um, of uninvested savings because they are really scared that if they invest the money to produce goods, people will not buy them, so they don't invest the money. So they have all this stash of money. And the phone call comes, do you want some more money for free? They say, okay, well, give it to me. And what they did with this money is they would go to the stock exchange and Siemens would buy back Siemens shares. Apple will take this money, it's free money, go to the New York Stock Exchange and buy some more Apple shares, you know, share buybacks. So the share prices went through the roof. The um, bonuses of the members of the boards of directors went through the roof because they were linked to the share price. Um, but there was no investment. There were no good quality jobs. There was no <laughs> investment in uh, things that the planet needs, like you know, renewables, green energy. There was none of that. So we had 13 years from 2008 onwards of this um, rather unbalanced pseudo growth where you've got Conglomerates doing remarkably well. Stock exchange is going through the roof. Um, those whose incomes were linked to the financial sector, to financialization, never having had it so good. Whereas the vast majority were sinking in bad quality jobs, in shit jobs, to put it scientifically. <laughs> this is David Graeber's book, right? 
uh, bullshit jobs. Okay, so you had bullshit jobs, you had falling living standards, you had it was a legal inevitability. That's what happened in Europe when in, uh, after 1999 um, you had austerity being practiced in a place like Germany that came to power. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's a no-brainer, as might say. Um, now, once we were at that point, you had the toxification of politics, the demise of any sense of democratic control over economic policy, because you have central banks that have been decoupled from our democracies through what is called central bank independence, which is a very um, interesting notion given that they've become more dependent than ever on JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and Wall Street. Uh, but when they talk about central bank independence, what they mean is they're independent of the demos, of democracy, of Congress, of government, of any kind of accountability to people. So you have central banks and financial markets decoupling from planet Earth, essentially. And really existing capitalism becoming utterly divided into two parts. One part is the old fashioned industries that fade away and who are asset stripped through private equity. You have a company that goes, you know, a private equity company that they buy a health service. The owner of the building, the first company is providing the services to the second company. Uh, and um, the whole thing is being asset stripped. So you've got these traditional service and industrial sectors that are essentially uh, becoming marginalized. And then you've got big tech. It was an accident of history that the internet, which began life under Bretton Woods, as a digital commons, a completely uncommodified market-free zone. That's what Internet One, I call it, was up until, let's say, the 1990s. And then on top of that, you have an olig oligopolistic, oligarchic Internet Two, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Netflixes, the Airbnbs. and Bs. It's an accident that this um, transformation of what used to be a digital commons to an oligarchic, uh, quite feudal internet and digital realm uh, coincided with socialism for the bankers and austerity for everybody else. And now we have, it's not a brave new world, it's a rather cowardly new world. And it's a, it's a new world which um, creates serious existentialist angst in the mind and heart of left-wingers like myself. Because, I'm not going to hide this from you, um, I was born a left-winger and I'm going to die a left-winger. Um, we left-wingers came to this planet believing that um, through our agitation, political work, theorizing, um, activities we will bring capitalism down. And we haven't. Capitalism has brought itself down without asking us for the, any permission and without fulfilling the, our dream that after capitalism something better would come. No, I'm very much fair that now, you know, I'm 61 now and I've decided to come face to face with a very nasty realization that we, the left, are a monstrous failure. And capitalism has done us the great um, disservice uh, <laughs> and insulted us so terribly by overthrowing itself and creating a new kind of feudalism. And allow me to present what my next book is going to be about. I've written, I'm just finishing today, 
well, hope to finish before I go to sleep tonight, the third chapter of it. It's, um, it's entitled Techno-Feudalism, a kind of digital feudalism. Allow me to, to share with you this crazy hypothesis of mine that in the same way that, you know, back in the late 18th century, people were not realizing that feudalism was dying and something else was being born, capitalism. I think that we are at this kind of turning point when in exactly the same way that socialism died in 1991 with the demise of the Soviet Union, Let's face it, right? After that, we of the left are facing one defeat after the next. Um, 2008 was the demise of capitalism. Now, that is a very strong claim, and I don't have that much time to articulate it in, so I'm going to be very brief, and then we're going to have a discussion. Capitalism has morphed many times since its inception in the 18th century. The capitalism of Adam Smith which was all about the competition and the, the rivalry between the baker, the brewer, and the butcher. That died by the end of the 19th century. It was replaced by the rivalry between you know, Thomas Edison and, and uh, Westinghouse uh, on the one hand, and General Motors and Ford on the other, oligopoly capitalism. Then you had 1929. Then you had Bretton Woods, which was almost a planned capitalist economy. I talked about it. Then in 1971, Nixon blew up Bretton Woods. These are all huge transformations of capitalism. But all those types of capitalism share two pillars that make a capitalist economy capitalist. What are the characteristics of capitalism that do not change, even when capitalism is changing its spots and is morphing into different variants of itself? There are two. One is, Capitalism is a system that is driven by profit. The only real motive that does all the driving work in capitalism is profit. Profit maximization, as economists call it. That was the case in the 19th century. It was the case in the 1920s. It was the case until very recently. I don't believe it is anymore. If you look at Elon Musk, if you look at uh, Jeff Bezos, if you look at Airbnb, if you look at Netflix, if you look at the parts of the exploitative extractive system we live in uh, that are taking off and which are the driving force of the system of today, you'll find that yeah, profit is important and everybody wants more profit. But it's not what drives the system. What drives the system today is central bank money. It's money minted by the central banks. It's what prevented capitalism from an early death in 2008. And today, why, why do you think the Fed is so scared of um, uh, rolling back QE? Because the system we live in has been completely addicted to central bank money. Central bank money is what is driving the great valuations, even though they have been falling recently and so on, um, the fear that they will fall even further is what stops the Fed from doing what it would have done two or three decades ago. So this is something we need to discuss, and I'm very much interested in Stephanie's views as well. But you know, if you look at Airbnb or Uber, their valuation has nothing to do with, the, with their profitability. Similarly with private equity. Second pillar, markets. Capitalism was the first mode of production in the history of humanity, where almost everything we did <laughs> uh, of consequence, of economic and political consequence, went through the market. All extraction of wealth and value was happening through markets. Under feudalism, you will recall, there was um, no such thing as a labor market. There was a lot of labor, but there was no labor market. If you were unlucky enough to have been born to a family of peasants, you were a peasant and you worked the land and you couldn't quit and you'd never received a wage. But just at the end of the harvest, the sheriff would come to the land, to the field, and would collect the barons or the lord's share of your crop. That's not the labor market. <laughs> um, so capitalism is the first system where all exploitation, all extraction, all value creation, or most of it, 
goes on inside some kind of market. Real estate market, labor market, capital market, market. Well, these days, when I look at Amazon.com, I don't see a market. When you enter Amazon.com, you exit capitalism. You exit the marketplace. It could be the equivalent of getting out of the building where you are and finding yourself in a town where you look, you look around and you realize that every building belongs to one man. Everything that is being sold and bought belongs to one man or is controlled by one man, Jeff Bezos. Right? Um, the air you breathe, the soil or the cement that you are treading upon belongs to one man. And indeed, that one man can decide what you see and what you don't see. Think about it. Your eyes do not choose what you, they see. That one man decides what you see. Now, that is not a market. It is a fiefdom. And it's a digital fiefdom, right? So if I'm right that increasingly profits are not driving the system and exploitation is not taking place or production or distribution is not playing, taking place within markets, not even oligopolistic markets, but it is taking place within digital fiefdoms, then let's go back to the original question with which I started. Can capitalism be, be civilized? It's an irrelevant question. This is not capitalism anymore. And no, this thing cannot be civilized. That's how, where I am. And, and I welcome questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, before I open it floor, for the last time this semester, I will pose the question that we have posed to each speaker who has joined us throughout the semester. So you all get the same question, and that is this. Are you a capitalist? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Well, firstly, I, I, I'm not a capitalist because I do not own capital goods um, that give employment to non-owners of capital goods. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm not a capitalist in the same way I'm not um, an astronomer. You know, I do not have a, <laughs> a capacity to gaze at the stars. But maybe you're asking me, Stephanie, if I'm a supporter of capitalism. Maybe I was, what were you going to say? Maybe I was asking you what? Maybe you're asking me whether I am a supporter of capitalism. I wasn't. You see, this is, ah. why this, this is why this question is fascinating to us. In the first week of the semester, mm. and we were all just getting to know one another, second day of class together, I gave them a blue book. Didn't count for anything, but I gave them several questions uh, and asked them to write some responses. Right. One of the questions asked them whether they thought of themselves as a capitalist. And the, the responses were really fascinating because some did what you did, not many, but some defined a capitalist in their own mind as a person who has a particular relationship to the stock of cap, like the, the, they own a business, right? They control, the, they didn't all say control means of production, but something along those lines, hire mm. workers, the employer, the boss, the person who owns, makes decisions, that sort of thing. But I think the majority of them took it the way that you started to go in the next part, which is my belief system, right? I, I believe in markets. I believe in freedom, I believe. And so we've been having this really interesting conversation throughout the semester about you know, how to think about a capitalist. Is it an ideology? Is it... Uh, a property relationship of some kind. And, and so it's been interesting to us to hear our different speakers respond to that question in the many different ways. And I'll tell you something, I'd love to hear you uh, comment on this, given what you just said about digital fiefdoms and Amazon and Google and the rest. When I posed this question to Mark Bly, who you know, yes, of course, uh, Mark said, 
we're all capitalists because we all own our data. So we have, this was his response, right? We all have ownership on our data. So the, the responses have been quite varied. What do you think of that? We all own our data. Well, in some parallel universe, maybe not in this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, 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 let me be a bit more precise on this, um, Stephanie. Uh, not only do we not own our own data, but what is fundamental to the way that um, digital feudalism has emerged, what is fundamental to the way that um, you know, the internet was transformed by big tech was that we do not own our identity. Uh, and our digital identity. So let, let, let me make this point because I think it's a point that needs to be made. It's both political and technical, theoretical and practical. Uh, some time ago, as you know, the Pentagon allowed civilians to use GPS. Up until a certain point, GPS, the global positioning system of the American military was um, not available to the civilian population. A decision was made to make it available to all of us. So now you can use GPS in order to find out where you are. All right? You don't have to pay for it. It's a commons. It's a public good. They could have licensed it to Google or to some Google, in which case you would have to pay. You would have to have some kind of subscription in order to find out where you are. They didn't do that. Similarly with Wi-Fi. I don't know whether you know that Wi-Fi was, was um, um, invented by uh, an Australian research lab called CSIRO, and it was given away for free. So we all have, none of us are paying for Wi-Fi. We could have been paying for Wi-Fi. Uh, the one thing, however, that, and, and, and indeed, you know, the, the original internet, with SMTP, with um, TCIP, and so on. These are all protocols that were a digital commons and allows us still to this day to send emails without actually paying and allows our, commun our, the, our computers to commun communicate with one another without paying. This is the old fashioned internet. However, uh, when it comes to your digital identity, in contrast to the physical ID card, you know, your driver's license that you get from your state government or your passport that you get from the federal government, which is a printed document issued by the state to you. It's a, it's a piece of paper that, or plastic that connects you via the state to your identity. The digital identity that you and I have doesn't belong to us. Uh, for instance, the bank, has part of my identity, the commercial bank. Uh, Google has part of my identity. Uh, Spotify owns my musical tastes. And when I need to, let's say, you know, send money to my daughter who lives in Australia, or buy a pair of socks, or contribute to some cause through, through the internet, then what I have to do is I need to beg a variety of these private conglomerates to allow me to use my identity to verify what it is that I'm trying to do, buy, sell, transfer. So we are certainly not in control of our data and we are of And this is the immense and exorbitant power of big tech over us. Uh, so I'm very interested that Mark Blau, Blau should think that. Uh, but you see, it's not, it's not strange because what struck me as a 17-year-old, 18, 16-year-old, whenever I, I read my first microeconomics textbook, was that these you know, great guys, they were usually guys with the exception of John Robinson, <laughs> the only woman who had written a textbook of micro when I was, uh, you know, young. Um, it was remarkable. If you look at the model of general equilibrium that they describe in chapter five, you know, it's
of an economy that is not capitalist. Because if you think about it, there's no such thing as capital. There is no such thing as money. There are only people, preferences, and in the There's no debt, you know this better than anyone, okay? So effectively what they do is they, they spend, economists, and that includes me, right? We spent, yeah, four decades of our lives, five, six, some of us who are older, studying a model of a, of a socialist economy and imagining that this is a model of capitalism. So if, you, if people say to you, are, are you a capitalist? You say, well, if, if you believe that this model is reflective of the reality, then yeah, of course because I'm a socialist. <laughs> so, you know, people, people who argue that everybody's a capitalist simply do not understand capitalism. And it's not that they have failed. It's a motivated failure. It's a way of escaping a very nasty reality by imagining universities your question by saying, yes, in a parallel universe, we're all capitalists. But in this universe, a small percentage of capitalists within the population. Most of them are vassal capitalists. That is, they may be capitalists, but they are small fry. And then you've got the techno feudal lords, hyper capitalists, Jeff Bezos of the world, and so on, who are running the show. And the majority of people who are modern day peasants who believe that they're entrepreneurs because they've been told to think that way. You know, you've got young people today who have no sense of personal liberty. By the way, I'm one of those leftists who laments the failure of the left to hold on to the idea of freedom because you know, I'm freedom loving. The reason I'm a lefty is because I believe in liberty. Um, I really don't believe in equality. I don't, be, I don't know what equality means, equality of what? I, for me, the problem is that capitalism is illiberal, that it subjugates both the worker and the capitalist to become servants of capital accumulation, which leads to, you know, to, to the poor not being able to sleep at night, worrying about how they're going to put food on the table, and the rich going to shrinks. So, it's, you know, capitalism is a very stupid system, a very inefficient system, a very liberal system. It is closer to the movie The Matrix where you know we have we are plugged into our capital accumulation machinery, uh, which we serve, and we think that we're being free in the process. All right, I'm going to get behind the camera and uh, allow some students to engage. Okay, let's we'll start here. So, throughout our class, we discussed how uh, the evolution of capitalism is matched by changes in ideology of observers of capitalism. Um, for instance, you know, people might try to rationalize their position in this economic system by choosing to believe in certain aspects of it being virtuous. Um, now with this transition you're saying that's taken place since 2008 into techno feudalism, I can't really connect that to changes in ideology among common people, among the non-capitalist, uh, I guess you could say the serfs, the new serfs. Um, do you think that ideology is going to evolve to favor this new system? And if so, how would that happen? Like always, um, there's nothing new here. Uh, we, there are two forces that are competing for uh, and not to, to the world around us because this is how we survive. The beauty of the human spirit is that we also have um, small acts of rebellion against what, what's happening to us. And, um, you know, it's, it's a tussle between really those two forces. And the reason why we need democratic politics is so that we coordinate our mutations in order to overthrow a system which is not particularly 
pleasant or um, consistent with um, what we need as a species, look at climate change, and what we can have. Uh, let, I, I, allow me to just add to this a small vignette. Um, I got into politics in you know six, seven years ago, and I lost touch with um, universities and students and so on, unfortunately. But nevertheless, I, just, I remember vividly that in the last five years of my academic career, between 2010 and 2015, I noticed an immense immersion of young people into the techno-feudal, Elon Musk-like ideology, uh, which was a highly liberal one. While on the one hand, proclaiming their libertarian self, what they were doing, and may, may, you know, as I said, I've lost touch with uh, your world, the world of young people in universities. So I may be off my rocker now, and you have to correct me if this is no longer true. Uh, but I have, I have noticed a, a remarkable loss of self-autonomy. Uh, Yannis, can you hear me? You're, you froze there. You, yeah, hold on, hold on just a second, Yannis. Being the, yes. We, we, you're, you're glitching where we, we lose you for periods of time. I don't right. know whether it would help. Sometimes it says bandwidth is weak on your end. I don't know whether it would help to turn off the camera part just for this portion and we'd get a stronger signal. But we missed um, part of your answer, just just right there at the very end of what you were saying. But it keeps glitching. Yeah, I can. Can I possibly entertain you with an explanation of the phenomenon? Sure. I live very I live very close to the United States Embassy in Athens, and uh, we have huge interference from uh, antennae that have just been <laughs> inserted in a roof next to my house. <laughs> so I blame the United States of America for this. <laughs> Seriously, I had, I, had, I had our provider come over and try to fix things. And they said, look, there's nothing we can do. These people, you know, they have cloaked the whole area with electromagnetic waves since the beginning of the Ukraine war. And all our Wi-Fi's have gone haywire. <laughs> well, let's go now, and I really want them to hear your answer. We were we were hearing you talk about ideology and the, and young people, and that's where. Okay, I'll, so I'll I'll start again. Is, can you hear me yes. reasonably well now? Solid right now. Okay, it's very good. good. Yeah, you see, the, the camera won't won't make any difference because when the interference comes, it doesn't matter whether the camera is on or off. Okay. Um, all right. So what I was saying. Look, an example, right? Uh, I noticed how students of mine used to f invest seriously in their social media profiles, fearing that what they would be writing in Twitter or posting in Facebook and so on would influence companies and HR departments and so on that would interview them for a job you know, say, two, two years down the road. Now, this is a huge loss of autonomy. When, you know, you, you, I remember people saying to me, oh my God, you know, how can I, how can I be spontaneous? And I was thinking, what? Oh, this is the definition of a stupid paradox. If you're trying to work out how to be spontaneous, <laughs> you've lost the plot mate, right? But because spontaneity is something that the Elon Musk's of the world, value, young people feel the need to cultivate a profile for, you know, being spontaneous and living the dream and following their heart. And it's not that they're following the heart, but they try to imagine what others imagine, that others imagine that they think they should be doing if they were following their heart. That is the end of liberalism. I'm a liberal. I'm a left winger because I'm a liberal. So the ideology of Techno-feudalism is already infesting the soul of young people, even those who don't think that they think politically or ideologically. And the, the more they believe that their thoughts are not ideological, the more ideological they are.
So Keynes's beauty contest comes to LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, here we go. Um, so I wanted to ask you a bit about your work as being the Greek financial minister. So we talked a bit in the class how the country is referred to as pigs, right? Was hurt badly mm -hmm. uh, in 2011 due to 2012 due to the euro and how normally you would obviously inflate the currency to help boost the economy, but you can't do that with the euro because other countries are relying on it. So I was curious, in an ideal world, would you have like a single global currency so that everyone would use, or would you have each country have its own independent currency? Oh, certainly not a global currency. Uh, unless you have uh, a global socialist government <laughs> uh, and you had cooperation and not uh, um, capital accumulation. Um, look, I think that if, if you wanted to speak about the optimal financial arrangements for the world, I think the nearest we've come to that was the proposal or a variant of the proposal by John Maynard Keynes at the Bretton Woods conference, when he suggested that we should hold, have our separate currencies, uh, but international trade and capital flows should be denominated in a common accounting unit. He called it the banker. I call it the cosmos. <laughs> I prefer the word cosmos to banker. Um, and especially today, it could be uh, a digital, um, essentially accounting unit. You would, you would not never print it. You would never have it in your pockets. You would never actually use it for the purposes of uh, trading. But imagine if you had a situation where uh, some progressive international monetary fund um, issued this uh, common accounting unit, call it bank or cosmos, whatever, and all trade were denominated in that unit and all capital flows. Because then what you could do um, is, um, and that was Keynes's, I believe, excellent and smart suggestion. Uh, you could say, OK, now we are going to apply a small tax, a small fee, uh, a small levy uh, to any country's trade deficit or trade surplus symmetrically. Uh, that would uh, put a break on trade imbalances, and it would allow you to create a piggy bank, bank you know, a, a common fund where all these levies would flow in to transfer them in the form of green investments to the global south. So you, you would have a mechanism that would simultaneously balance out international trade and use the funds that it procured in order to transfer investments from the global north to the global south. And imagine that if there was a second levy that did the same thing, you know, in the same way that you have Uber surge, when there is extra demand for Uber, you pay more for your ride. Imagine that you had a levy that um, was uh, implemented, it was, it was added onto capital flows that surged in order to prevent fast movements of speculative money flows from the north to the south and fast exits of capital inflows, outflows in other words, from the global south to the global north. Uh, this would be a very good way of um, rebalancing global capitalism in the short run. I don't believe that capitalism can be civilized, I've explained that, but it would be something very good to have instead of the International Monetary Fund that we have now, or the Bretton Woods system that we ended up having because John Maynard Keynes' uh, proposal was dropped. And it was dropped by the American representative who said, no mate, we're not going to have an international accounting unit, we have the dollar. It is our currency and it's our hegemony. So piss off. That's what effectively they said to John Maynard Keynes. Back. 
technophilism is basically an inevitability at this point, or do you have, I think you proposed uh, corporal syndicalism as a solution to this. Do you think there's any like peaceful resolution that can become about to adapt that, or is it another okay, option? I, I, I have difficulty hearing you. you. Either you are too far back or you're not speaking into the microphone. He's, he's, um, saying, he's saying it's techno feudalism baked in at this point, or is there a pathway out, as you suggested with uh, corporate, uh, corporate syndicalism. syndicalism? Yes, oh my goodness, you've read my book, thank you. <laughs> um, look, there's always a way out. The, the, the last thing I want to impart to you is a sense of helplessness. Everything could be different. We could change everything. The greatest impediment to change is um, the belief amongst a very large percentage of the population that we live in the best of all possible worlds, that the world may be you know, awful, but it's the best we could have. I don't want you to, to take this out of <laughs> my talk. Um, we do have some very serious foes to deal with, uh, they have some very powerful weapons against the vast majority of people in every country in the world, but we could change stuff. What happened? Connection. Can you talk to him? He's gone. Are you there still? Oh, no. oh. <laughs> oh he's back. He's back. He's back. So did we get? Do we? We got the gist of the answer there. Uh, oh, uh oh, are you muted? We can't hear you. Can't hear you. He's on your seat. Are you muted? <laughs> no, we. Uh -oh. No, we. We are okay. Yes. It's we aren't hearing bit. you. This doesn't say that he's muted, so it might be a connection. Give him mute. We think there's a connection problem. Maybe We're he not... turned off his his camera. No, his camera's on. No. Oh, if he turns it off and Maybe turns it back on? Him. Maybe. Or maybe he can rejoin. There, there is some suggestion that you leave and rejoin and that might resolve. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, will things the, um, happen. No, we can continue recording, no problem. It will pick up the recording. We'll just have two separate recordings? Or? Of course, two separate. Two separate, yeah. Okay, he's mute now, I suppose. Let me end 